Hi there. One of the things I've always liked about traditional painting is the physical surface of the image. The thickness and texture of the brush strokes and once it's dried, the way that glazes can wash over and interact with that texture to create amazing surface effects. When I started to use digital painting software, I was quickly drawn to the software that simulated natural media effects and for a number of years Rebel Software has been one of the leading natural media simulation art packages. And I was delighted to be selected as one of their featured artists. Today I'm going to take you through the process of creating a digital painting using Rebel 5. My name is Pete and welcome to Basement Picasso. So what we'll be looking at today is a full process video. Uh, it was recorded over four sessions and we'll be going through each of those using a combination of real-time footage and the feature that's uh, now available in the latest Rebel software, the time-lapse uh, recording to see every stroke uh, as it's painted, uh, which is a really, really good uh, feature. We're not going to go through all the preparatory work, so what we're having a look at here is some of the material that I put together as I prepared for doing the painting. So that included some digital photo manipulation, some digital painting, a little bit of sketching and some preparation of various masks which we'll use as we go through the process and I've also used a number of assets that I've created over the years which have leveraged a lot of traditional material, uh, traditional brush strokes and things that I've incorporated into the, the work that I use. I also use a lot of text and letters and words within the, the artwork and you'll see that both in the the brushes and the stencils uh, that I use. And then we'll go through and we'll show uh, each of the different uh, stages of the painting uh, as we go through. So to begin with, uh, we've got uh, Rebel 5 software. Uh, this is the Pro Edition, so it has uh, some uh, really interesting features which we'll touch on in terms of uh, real pixel, real pigment colours, uh, nanopixel technology uh, and so on. And I'm drawing on my Hue on Canvas uh, screen resolution 1440p, which is a really good size for a 24 inch monitor. So you can see, see me painting in real time. Uh, the image is a uh, a4 size canvas uh, at about uh, 200 dpi and the, you can see the image uh, that I'm working from as a reference in the, the top left which is the photograph that's been trimmed, cropped, colour corrected and digitally painted to make the design uh, what I was interested in trying to do. So to start the painting uh, I'll do a little bit of colour picking from the image and then start to blend that in with colours that are being selected from the colour palette. Um, what I'm trying to do at this stage is, is really think of it almost like a colour mixing palette rather than a painting. So I'm really more interested in actually just exploring interesting colours mixing colours together and looking at how the, the colours start to interact and uh, create new colours and new mixes as they, they start to, to blend. So um, it's a little bit of starting to block in but at this stage I, I'm really not concerned at all about trying to get things in the right position, I'm not drawing shapes, I'm not drawing edges. I'm really focused just on starting to think about colour and marks and textures and just beginning to uh, start the, the painting process. 
we're going to build it up in layers. Uh, as I said, we're going to do this over uh, a number of sessions. Uh, and typically I do sort of 45 minutes to an hour and then take a quick break and have a look at what I've done and review it and think about the next stage. Uh, and I find that kind of tempo tends to, to work well for, for this sort of scale of image. You'll see that the uh, image of a uh, reduced down, so uh, I'm drawing not quite a thumbnail size, but we're certainly we're not zoomed in, we're not interested in any way in, in terms of detail. Uh, this is very much just about colour and, uh, and blocking at this stage. Um, and we'll, we'll work quite zoomed out for, for quite a long time um, before we get anywhere near doing um, anything that would constitute detail uh, in terms of trying to, to finish the picture. The brushes that I'm using, there's a small palette of brushes open and there's only six uh, in there. Four of those are uh, default brushes that are available in Rebel 5 and two of them are custom brushes that I've uh, made myself. And, and that's basically all I'm going to use for the entire uh, painting, with the exception of the glazing technique uh, that I'll use. Uh, we will start to use uh, some of the um, default watercolour brushes uh, to, to be able to lay that in. But for the, uh, the majority of the painting, those, those are the only six uh, brushes that I'll be using. And you'll see me swap uh, between them um, from time to time. So we get a bit of variety in terms of both the, the colours that we're putting down, but also the, the textures and the marks. The two custom brushes that I've got um, have quite a lot of detail and texture in the, the actual uh, underlying uh, patterns. So there's shapes, there's text, and it introduces a lot of sort of randomness in the the marks uh, in terms of the kind of style um, that I tend to, to work in and just helps to stop, uh, stops me from getting too detailed, too fussy, uh, too quickly. So it, it makes you constantly uh, react to what's going down on the surface because it, it introduces uh, little elements of, of randomness that you're, you're constantly looking at and evaluating and deciding if that's working the way you want it to or um, or whether it's something you need to, to build on top of. So you can see we're now uh, looking at the time lapse for the initial blocking and as I said earlier this is one of the new features in Rebel 5 that you can uh, set up and do a time lapse recording uh, which you can then play back and see all the strokes uh, being uh, re recorded. And it's a really good way to kind of review your painting process and uh, to be able to produce videos like this very easily, which uh, I think is, is really good. Um, and it works really well. It's really, really effective. So what you'll probably notice at the moment is I'm not really focusing on any one particular area. Uh, I'm really working all over the canvas and this is really just very much a, a first pass to uh, get the initial uh, sort of block in and uh, set out the, just the general shapes and the general uh, colours. What we'll do now is we'll bring in one of the assets we created previously, which is one of the, the line drawings. And you'll see from the, the sketch that's, that's just been dropped in, it's really, really loose. Yeah, I mean, it's just a few scribbly lines that give a very vague indication of kind of edges and shapes. Um, and at this stage of the painting, we're not trying to do anything detailed. We're not trying to... Um, get to finished marks or the finished edge quality or anything like that. Um, so the 
the looseness of the lines helps to to make sure that we um, focus on the big shapes and the, the big marks and, and the big texture of, uh, within the painting. What we're doing at the moment is I'm still actually working on the uh, the line layer. So we set the uh, alpha um, for that layer so that it prefer preserves the transparency. And what I'm now doing is actually painting the lines using some of the colours from the painting. And this is part of my, my sort of standard process. Um, when you drop a sketch on top of your picture, if your sketch is dark lines, um, it stands out as something very separate from your image. And, and most people will then have to, to work quite hard to paint out those lines and um, remove them uh, in terms of the, the kind of edges that they, they create. Uh, and one of the things I've found is if you take those lines and then um, paint them using the colours of the, the image, um, and you'll see that I've done some light, some dark. Um, what you do is you, you integrate the, the line work um, better into the image. And then if any little bits of those lines do end up remaining in, in the final image, um, they're not just a black line, they're, they're something that's uh, a bit more integrated um, and something that can potentially be left. Um, but given that this is the first uh, iteration, the first pass of the, the painting, you'd probably find not many of these lines will actually be left by the, the time we've worked over the, the painting in the next few sessions. So now we use those lines and the, the sort of big shapes that that's creating. And we're going to spend most of the time now using the colours from the picture. So the picture is increasingly becoming the colour palette and um, when we swap around and select different colours, most of the time that colour will be coming from the painting itself. Occasionally we'll use the colour uh, palette uh, to, to modify that slightly, um, but generally the, the colours are, are coming from the, the actual image itself. So one of the other things you might notice uh, in terms of the, the overall image is the the darks, the shadow areas are, are not very dark at the moment and, and that's a very um, deliberate and conscious decision and we'll uh, see why we've done that once we get on to the sort of masks and the, and the washes later on. Um, but at the moment it's uh, it's a very conscious decision to try and keep the colours generally in the sort of mid and light tones. So we're putting the right sorts of colours down, um, but then we'll work on the, the washes as we go forward. So now we bring in the first uh, of the masks. So this is a, a black and white image that we bring in and we'll select that layer and we'll call it a mask and uh, we will we'll use this to start to do the shadows so what we want to do is to uh, go to the filter and select black as alpha and so you can see that the white's remaining but the black has now gone transparent so we can start to see what the uh, the shadow area is going to look like and we want to mask opaque so the white areas are now effectively the mask um, we make that a mask layer, so you can see the little M uh, next to the, the layer. Um, and we can then hide it, so the mask is still active at this point, um, but it, the, it's not obstructing our, our view, so, so we're conscious that it's there. Um, and we can now start to, to work on the image.
So a couple of important things that we've got uh, set up at the moment. You can see um, that we have the uh, panel in the top left hand side with the watercolour behaviour. And what we're doing is uh, adding uh, watercolour uh, on top of the image. And one of the really important settings for this is the rewet. You can see that that's set to zero. Uh, and that's really important because uh, what it does is it allows the, the watercolour to flow over the, the paint that's there uh, without reactivating it. Um, what you find is if you don't have rewet set to zero, then all your thick, chunky paint will uh, slowly uh, gravitate down the page as it all sort of gets reactivated and rewet. This is a very nice effect and, and can do some amazing things. Um, but what we're trying to do here is to leverage the colour uh, on top of the, the paint uh, that's been put down uh, and create a glazing effect. So you can see that we're uh, using a, a reasonably dark blue because you know we want to start to bring through the shadows and differentiate to the dark areas from the, the light areas. Um, but we're trying to keep it as transparent as possible so the underlying colours and texture and quality uh, is coming through uh, that glaze. And what's for me unique to uh, Rebel um, compared to any other art package at the moment is these washes react not just to the paper texture but they react to the actual paint texture and the thickness and uh, and the colours flow around the, the thick paint and the, the thick marks that you've made um, in a way that is just uh, unparalleled by, by anything else at the moment. It's just an incredibly realistic and really satisfying uh, effect to, to be able to add. And for, for somebody that, um, you know, use that sort of technique traditionally and, you know, typically had to wait for hours, if not days, for the, the underlying paint to dry before you could then apply the glazes and wash them over and let them flow around. Being able to do this in digital software sort of instantaneously is, is just fantastic. So you can see as we go into the, the time lapse, uh, you can see the the diffusion and how the colours spread out and say uh, I, I tend to have the diffusion setting quite high so it spreads quite quickly which is generally what I'm looking for and what you'll see is the the mask although it's hidden and you can't actually see it um, it's interacting and preventing the colour going into to certain areas so uh, it's helping to uh, build up the, the shadow image and uh, and allow us to, to pick up some of the darker areas. But one of the things you need to be really careful of with, with making these sort of masks, particularly if you want uh, a, a sort of a chunkier, you know, more um, brush mark kind of painting, something that's not, you know, sort of really crisp and detailed and realistic, um, is you need to be careful with the the way that you do the masks. Uh, if you just take a photo and then just do a black and white contrast um, from that, then you'll find your, your mask is really detailed, really sharp edged. And when you paint it in, you get two completely different languages that are kind of fighting against each other. And you can see this a little bit in some of the, the sort of shadows at the bottom where we've got marks of the paint and then we've got quite sharp edges on some of these uh, shadows. So that's something that I'm quite careful with and the masks that I, I produce, are, they're not photographic, they, I, I process them to effectively paint them so that we get soft edges and marks in the actual uh, mask itself. So at this point we're just doing a little bit of painting back into the mask, so we're back to the, the sort of oil brushes. 
I'm just working around the, the painting where uh, introducing just a little bit of sort of random marks and looseness and just generally trying to, to keep the image uh, as fresh as possible. And so this is now starting to, to transition into the second session of painting. So I took a wee break and now come back and picked up on the, uh, the oil painting work. Um, one of the things I always do with the, the break is just stop and just have a little bit of a, a look at the image and just to rethink about where it's got to and what we're trying to do, what we're going to do next. And it's sometimes the hardest thing with that is actually when you come back and, and try and get back into the flow and how, how do you sort of get things moving again and get the, the kind of rhythm going with it. So quite often if, if I'm at that point and, and sort of struggling to, to think, right, what, what's next, then um, I'll start by actually loosening things up, adding more randomness, making random marks and um, just creating uh, almost chaos uh, in some sense to just give me things to then look at and respond to and start to, to correct. Um, so my, my process is very much around a sort of cycle of trying to add more detail and make things more correct and then um, loosen up, add randomness and add chaos and, and break things and constantly going backwards and, and forwards between the two um, to, to let them play off each other and, and to allow us to, to kind of build up the picture over time. You can see more washes coming in and running down the page. I've got the, the tilt set so that uh, the, the colour the color washes are being affected by gravity. And uh, you can see the, uh, the washes are also um, playing between light and uh, dark uh, as we come from the, the, the distance into the foreground. So what I've done here is import another one of my uh, sort of pre-made assets. So these are brush marks that were made traditionally. Um, so actually, you know, physically painted these and then um, scanned them in to, to get all these sort of uh, random brush marks um, and then used a, a, one of the other digital tools to um, basically paint them into a, a sort of random structure so that we've got these uh, sort of random marks. And I've brought them in as a, a, a new layer and again set the um, the transparency so that we preserve it uh, and that way I can keep the shape of the, the marks that we've got. And what I'm going to uh, do is to basically integrate that into the painting. So you'll see me going around picking colours from the painting and then just basically um, painting into uh, each of those shapes. So we get the, the brush shape, um, we get that sort of real, uh, sort of natural kind of mark, and uh, it makes a very distinctive individual shape. So I find this is a, a really good way of, of getting um, really interesting uh, marks uh, into uh, part of the, the painting. And you'll see that I'm using um, brushes that have got quite a lot of texture in them. So not only do these give you quite a distinctive um, brush mark shape, but also something that then gives you um, a little bit of extra uh, texture within that particular space. So uh, it's uh, it's trying to bring in a combination of uh, sort of looseness and randomness. Uh, sort of paint the marks and and creating more interest again in the the surface of the, the image. So a, a lot of these images, a lot of these shapes are um, not <laughs> not really in the right place in that sense. If you think about you know if you're trying to paint realistically, if you're trying to paint sort of detail and all that sort of thing but um, you know my, my style is more around the, the interest in the the balance between the, the image and and the surface quality uh, 
and the the marks that that you're making. So um, I find this this is a you know really good way to to not get too too hung up and too tight on on the detail and, and really just focus on being um, loose and creative and and creating uh, you know randomness that that you then then need to to deal with and work with and incorporate into the image because at, at the end of the day this is it's not a copy of the photo it's not a copy of the reference material it's uh, it's a painting uh, in its own right and uh, you know it, it needs to um, have something you know interesting and unique that, that makes it um, you know worthy of of you know being being painted So again, using the time-lapse footage, uh, we can go through and you'll see that we, once we've finished integrating those marks, um, actually drop that layer down, same as same as I did with the, the line work. Um, I, as much as possible, try to work on just one layer. Um, I don't try and build up sophisticated layer structures. Um, and that's primarily because I'm as much as possible trying to simulate the the real natural mechanisms of of painting i know you can do you know amazing things with digital paintings and uh layers and layer control and so on You'll see there's some uh, washes going in uh, and this time the, the, the washes are just completely freehand so there's no mask active at this point. It's really just looking at what areas do we want to, to try and darken um, and uh, and then just using the, uh, the, the watercolour washes to uh, add a little bit of depth, playing between sort of uh, warm and cool, so you'll see sort of swaps between sort of orange washes and blue washes, uh, just to try and help uh, support the uh, the sense of depth that we're we're trying to, to bring into this image. So at this point, uh, I decided that the um, the image would benefit if the, the underlying canvas was uh, red. Um, one of the things I've noticed with this particular canvas is you can't change the, the canvas colour, so what I did was um, drop in a new layer and just filled it with red, and you can see the little bits of the, the canvas that were still showing through uh, came up as red. And what I was doing was preparing to do some uh, stencil work, and um, so I've made that underlying canvas red and dropped that into a layer and now brought in uh, another one of the assets that uh, I've made, which is just a, a block of text um, that I pulled together and then uh, added uh, as a stencil. And so we drag the stencil and make it bigger than the image because we want to have it going all the way across. And then what I've done is hidden the stencil but kept it active so you can't see it. But what it allows me to then start to do is to basically paint in bits of the text uh, that are uh, included in that stencil. I'm not going to do, you know, the whole thing. Uh, you know, I don't want absolutely every bit of text that was there. I'm just sort of uh, picking highlights. And uh, again, it's part of, you know, bringing interest into the picture, um, bringing variety. Um, but I'm doing it in a way that's, that's very conscious in terms of trying to support the, the sort of work that's there. It's trying to build up on the shapes and thinking about um, the sort of subject that we're working with. So in this case, the, the trees and the, the bushes and the, 
it's the graphs and the path and so on and uh, and then very much using the, the colors of the image so you'll see that you know we're we're picking and, and spreading the uh, the colors uh, of the image that we've got so the the text is all becoming part of the, the story um, and in this case the, the the text happened to to be something that I already had but one of the things I'll quite often do is um, look for text and narrative that is related to the actual image and the actual subject that I've got um, and then I, you know you, you'll never read you know big long pieces of text but it you know it, it means there's there's something more in the actual image that you know the image has got a little bit of history and a little bit of story of, of something that sort of sits behind that. So the next thing I want to do is I'm going to use the, the same stencil and this time um, I'm just going to spin it round a bit and what I'm thinking of is basically the, the direction of the text and how that aligns to the, the structure of the image so it, it's not quite thinking about it in, in absolute sort of perspective but it, it is a nod to you know this path and the, the kind of linear angles of the, the path and uh, the the way that that uh, kind of edge of the path sort of recedes into the distance. So uh, the text that's going in now will uh, line up to that and and give it a, a hint of that perspective. They're, they're not intended to be pure perspective lines, but it uh, it just starts to think about it in a little bit similar sort of way. And it also adds a bit of variety. If all, all the text was going in the same direction, then it starts to become a, a, a noticeable pattern that's sort of sitting on top of the painting. And again, you start to get this problem of two different uh, languages kind of speaking with each other. So we do a little bit on the path and then similarly uh, spin the stencil round so the text is, is going vertically. Um, and that's to allow me to uh, to do some marks in the, the grasses and, and bushes primarily on the, uh, the left hand side uh, more than anything to to get a sort of sense of some of the verticality of some of the, the kind of vegetation that's in there. Um, so effectively using this as a, a as a way to draw into the painting it's, it's creating uh, directional elements and um, Again, just introducing randomness and interest to, uh, to the painting. So once we're finished with the stencil work, I'll just remove that uh, completely uh, and then that allows us to, to get back to, to just painting on the, uh, the image normally. So one of the things that we get with the, the washes of colour that we put on is um, it introduces a lot of subtle variation and once you have that sort of variation as you as you paint back into it and the paint mixes and, and blends you start to get a lot of intermediate colours and I think one of the um, 
biggest improvements for, for me in, in Rebel 5 is the uh, the use of the uh, the real um, pigment colour mixing which just gives some tremendous intermediate colours uh, the way that uh, blues and, and yellows mix to give um, really vivid greens and, and really realistic kind of colour mixing is um, compared to the original RGB colour, one, once you see it, it is just absolutely night and day in terms of the, the improvement. Um, so putting those glazes down and then painting back into them really gives some, some absolutely fantastic uh, colours coming through. Colours that you maybe wouldn't necessarily have, have picked if you tried to do it directly. So the combination of the, the washes and the, the real pigment uh, mixing just produces some really uh, really interesting uh, colour combinations. So at this point we've brought in uh, another one of the um, line drawings, the slightly more detailed one. And I say slightly more detailed, I mean you'll see, still see it. it's pretty loose and pretty rough. Um, we're going to do the same Thing again, I've locked the transparency of the, the line work and that way I can paint on the lines. So the, the lines are um, sitting there as a separate layer at the moment and same process as we did last time. I'm going to just pick uh, lots of colours from the, uh, the painting itself uh, and then just basically paint the lines. Um, you'll see some lines going in light, some going in dark, some almost start to disappear um, and that's absolutely fine. What, what we're trying to do is, um, as I said before, integrate the two so that we don't have two things that look like they're fundamentally sitting on different layers because that means that you know there's, there's two different languages there that aren't, aren't effectively um, working together. So uh, by going through and uh, you know taking a little bit of time to to kind of paint the lines uh, again, it's it's back to the same situation that you know if any of these do remain in the final painting, then they're far more likely to to be coherent with uh, the overall painting um, and something that that can sit there uh, right at the end. You'll see we've got quite a lot more detail in the um, the light areas within the path. We're starting to, to mark up where the kind of edges and, and shapes of those are. Um, and that's something you'll see uh, kind of playing backwards and forwards with um, as we kind of take the, the painting forward. Um, and that was one of the main things that really interested me with this um, sort of reference material. So this is the photo that I took myself uh, one day when I was out for a walk, it's a path not far from where I live and the sun was just really nice the way it was coming across, casting these shadows and the kind of dappled light falling across the path and the way that it was highlighting the, the kind of bushes and um, that was that was really what kind of caught my eye at the time. So so these sort of shapes on the, the ground are really um, kind of interesting and uh, something that we're going to try and build up as, uh, as we go forward. So just to finish off the, the line work and now this is, this is probably about the first time in the whole sort of painting process that we're starting to think of a little bit more about detail, shapes and, and edges. So it's the first time that we you know, even begin to consider sort of zooming in and uh, starting to refine the, the painting at a, a kind of different level of, of detail. So the groundwork's there, the, the colour harmony, the sort of colour story is generally where, where I'm trying to get it to. Um, and now it's trying to find a balance between how much detail we're going to add, uh, how refined we want to make it, how crisp various edges are going to be versus how loose and, and how textural we can try and keep things because um, the, the two will tend to fight against each other. Uh, a lot of detail and a lot of texture tend to compete so it's always a, a kind of careful balance 
trying to get the, the right amount of detail and, and preserve the texture and the, the marks and the, the quality um, that you've created. Um, but yeah, this, this is the first time that we're really starting to, to work with slightly smaller brush sizes and uh, thinking a bit more about, particularly around the sort of middle part, which is in essentially the, the sort of initial focal point of the image, although I don't, I don't try and call it out too much, we try and keep it slightly subdued and you, you'll see as we work towards the, the kind of finish that, you know, we're not trying to highly polish and render um, these these parts of the, the image. Um, it is very much about just getting a, a sense of the figure uh, and just enough to take you initially into that image to then allow you to, to kind of start moving around the picture and, and exploring the, the colours and the, the shapes that, that are, uh, are, are there. So this is the, the part of the process where you can start to spend as, as much time as, as you want uh, really to take the, the painting as, um, you know, as far as you, you want to, to go with it. Um, my style personally is not, it's not highly illustrative, uh, it's not um, trying to be uh, you know, hyper realistic or really detailed. Um, but it should read as an image, so you know my, my first priority is always to make sure that the the thumbnail of the image is convincing. You, you should be able to you know recognise and decipher the image um, when it's a thumbnail. It should read really clearly. Um, but then as you start to zoom into it, it should become more and more about just a collection of marks and shapes and textures and um, you'll see towards the end when, when we start to look at it and sort of zoom in there's there's lots of bits of this painting if you zoom in on them they're, they're just completely random abstract uh, pieces in themselves um, and that that's really largely what uh, what i'm trying to to get to is to um get this balance between the, the surface quality and the uh, the overall uh, image without without over rendering it um, and I think that's one of the you know the, the really good things with uh, Rebel is the um, the quality of the the marks that it can make and the uh, you know the the thickness of the strokes and the the way that it can blend um, it just you know gives you puts a, a kind of natural sense to to what you're actually doing um, you know it just it feels convincing um, you know compared to, to what it would feel like if I was trying to do these things traditionally in, in real life when um, thinking about you know how I would be doing that with different mediums and the paint and different thicknesses and different brushes and the ways of ways I've been trying to make different marks so um, it, you know it's it's a very very sort of similar process but the uh, you know the speed and flexibility that the the kind of digital approach gives you is uh, is just second to none so we come into the the fourth session and for this I bring through a slightly more detailed mask. Um, again, it's not straight photographic. It's been sort of processed to be a kind of painted black and white image. So there's a little bit more detail, um, but it, again, it's not really highly sort of crisp detailed uh, edges. And um, the other thing when I'm, I'm working with these sorts of masks is the intention is not to 
paint uh, every visible section of this mask and to, to you know to do an absolute print of this as a shape uh, it's to um, think about how bits of it can help the image so uh, you know e each bit of the um, the wash that's going to go in is considering how how that's starting to to work with the the rest of the the image um, and it's it, it's looking at what we have with the image and, and where we want to to try and add uh, extra bits so um so you'll see that uh, you know we don't paint the, the whole of this mask but we will use some some quite large pieces of it because at the moment the the sense of the shadow going across the path isn't quite there yet it's, it just doesn't have the sense of that a sort of dappled light and that, that's one of the main things that I want to to try and resolve in this last session. I'm, I'm starting to uh, get comfortable with the kind of lights and colours and contrasts in, in the distance um, but this, this sense of light flowing across and, uh, and, and the way the shadows are, are being cast and the way that the light was sort of flickering through it uh, just isn't quite there yet so so that that's the the kind of main thing that i want to to try and resolve at this point and again we're doing the um the same as before so the mask was brought in uh, we made the uh, blacks uh, into alphas and then i uh, masked out the opaque section which is the white um, and then we've we've hidden the mask. So the mask is active, which you can uh, see in the layers panel um, with the, the little M next to the detailed mask. Uh, little dots underneath it showing which layers uh, that's uh, affecting. Um, I did say I'd, I tend to work on a single layer. The layers below that are effectively snap points. So I've just saved from the previous session the, the image. But the, the, what I'm working on is is the uh, a single image in a single layer. That, that's generally what I constantly do. So you can see in the time lapse now. There's some there are some really big bits of the wash going in to, to really start to get the, the shadow um, moving across the the picture, uh, and that's now really starting to interact with the, uh, the textures that. Have have been built underneath the, you get little bits of the original canvas texture and then you get the the wash interacting with the the paint and the the thickness of the paint uh, which gives uh, just some really nice effects that some things that would would just be very difficult to to do uh, any other way in general i'll use the the masks to, to darken but I will very occasionally use um, washes for, for sort of light or, or medium colours as, uh, as well um, but in general I try and keep the, the thick paint for the, the light colours and the, the sort of medium tones um, and then keep the washes uh, using the, the sort of transparent things for the the darker areas and, and that's a very traditional uh, approach that you keep your your darks thin and your your lights thick um, that's the you know, traditional way of uh, approaching uh, oil paint again using the the variety of brushes some of the out the box one along with the um, the two that I've made myself so that we're trying to get uh, you know a variety of brush marks and, and shapes um, and using the um, the various sort of blending modes so there's the the paint the paint mix and um, the paint blend um, and particularly when the, the washes have added nice sort of subtle colors into some of the areas then those paint and blend modes really help pick up those colors and, and start to uh, to work them together. 
and we've just darkened up some of the, the dappled light because some bits of it were standing out uh, a little bit too much, so um, we've kind of knocked those back uh, and then painting into the, the shadow area just to, to get a bit more interesting variety. So at this point we're uh, starting to get reasonably close to what I'm looking for and it's now sort of looking at the image as a whole and trying to work out um, what areas I want to work without trying to trying to avoid overworking areas and um, you know making too much detail in an area that then makes that sort of stand out from the, the image as a whole. Um, but looking at how we can uh, try and add more more detail, more texture, and more interest, um, and, and just help kind of bring the painting to towards a finish. So for the last bit of the painting, um, I'm, I'm getting to the point where I'm, I'm really happy with uh, what I've done with it. It's it's kind of starting to to kind of make the uh, statement I was trying to to make. And um, at the end, I usually just add in what's effectively a, a little sort of few finishing touches. So it's the same sort of principles to, to what I was doing um, previously in terms of random marks, random shapes, random text. Um, but these ones are really going to be um, much more visible because they're, they're right at the end. They're, they're very deliberate kind of marks. And so they need to, to be worked quite carefully and, and really sort of integrated into the painting. So the first one I brought in was just a little bit of random text, which I, I just rotated around and have locked the alpha and then painted in to, um, to just integrate it a little bit. So it's kind of sitting on those sort of flowers um, and then just make it a bit of interest. And then bring in another one. Again, this is a, a sort of pre-made shape. It's got random text, random brush marks, some of which are traditional scanned things and uh, just a, a shape that I've made that's got lots of kind of randomness and interest to it. And same principle again, we'll lock the alpha on that and, uh, and then look for colours within the painting to, to paint it. Um, and what we're going to try and do is I just make sure that it's um, it's well integrated into the painting and it's helping to add both shape and marks and and texture um, so it's it sort of sits off the surface and and really um, is quite clearly something different it, you know it's clearly not a representative part of the painting um, but it adds interest and it helps to play between the concept of trying to be realistic and, and have this, you know, we've got a path, we've got a sort of 3D scene, we've got bigger in the distance and we've got things that are trying to, to make that kind of uh, 3D reality. Um, and then we've got something that is trying to basically pull you back and remind you that this is actually just a 2D surface. It, it is just a picture and it's paint and it's texture and it's marks and you know, it's not an illusion. Um, and that's something that I'm very interested in is, is playing these things against each other and how you balance the, the kind of looseness and, and the interest um, versus the the reality of, of the image.
So once we've added those two and painted them in, there's so one more that I want to use, which is again just another random shape with bits of text and bits of texture. And same process again, just positioning it, thinking about it as a as a shape on a two-dimensional surface and where that potentially fits in the image. Um, locking the uh, alpha and then again going back to, to then just be able to um, paint, paint that in, um, get some thickness to that paint and uh, and end up with something that just adds more interest to uh, to the image. The challenge with these is always to just get that blend between the image um, that you're adding uh, being sufficiently integrated that it doesn't leap out of the image but at the same time being something that, that's really quite clear and uh, you know it's it's something of interest in its own right you can see we're we're adding thicker paint and really just emphasizing that that kind of shape uh, so that the that space in the sky sort of alternates between something that is sky in the distance and then something that is texture of the, the image and, and the surface and, and, and helps play between those two. So this is really one of the, the first sort of more detailed pieces of work I've been able to do with Rebel 5. I was fortunate enough to be part of their beta test program and had a, a look at it, but I was still very much say still learning about some of the new features and just getting a sense of the, the feel of the tool and the marks and the, uh, the way that it can create these sort of thick paints and thin washes. But I think the, the potential with this latest version is is just absolutely fantastic from what I've seen so far. I, I'm really enjoying the the way that this works, the uh, the quality uh, of the, the marks that it makes, the, the sort of simulation that it, it produces and, and just how uh, natural and, and realistic some of the things are. It's, it's really just um, truly truly spectacular at times so I'm really excited and interested to see how they, they continue to take this forward and uh, really looking forward to, to being able to spend more time and uh, do more work and uh, learn more about you know what what the software is capable of and uh, you know how to how to work with it. And so that's uh, that's the piece finished. And if we sort of zoom in, you can see what I was talking about in terms of little sections of this almost just becoming completely abstract little pieces in their own right. Uh, they're just shapes and marks and textures. And to me, just absolutely remarkable that this has all been created digitally. It feels organic and natural and really just uh, just incredibly impressive what uh, what these sorts of tools can can do now so i've really enjoyed putting this together um i've enjoyed putting the, the video together and uh, i hope uh, it's been something of interest uh, for you to watch and uh, i hope we get a chance to uh, to do some more things like this uh, in the future so um hope that was of interest to you and uh, thanks very much for watching